I'm Charlotte. And I like to dress up when I teach. This is me. And two of my roles. I am living history. And the first picture here, I'm an Iron Age priestess. My name is Anna. It's a type B dress, I think. Yeah. And so plant uh, colour and everything. That yellow picture, I'm a man. Because I'm an ab. Uh, I'm an abbey. I'm called Christopher. And I'm leading some monks to prayer at a monastery. I come from a very small museum. And still we have 11 departments. It's uh, in the municipality of Skanderborg, in the middle of Jutland, Denmark. And I want to talk about what I do in teaching in one See, we have worked together with the local schools for the past six years on uh, developing school sessions. And I'm head of the education department. That means I'm the only person there. So I both develop and I do the stuff. My background is that I'm an archaeologist. As a student, I was teaching at the, the museum next to the university, and I found out that I was very good at trying to make this history become alive to those pupils. I'm sure you've all experienced having a very dull history teacher, and you're just lying like this when he was teaching history. I'm trying to make an impression and to make the story come alive. First, I'd just like to introduce the archaeological site. The Oak Abbey Museum, one of our five museum departments. We also have six archives, local archives, and together that's the Museum of Scandal. This one is the ruins of a Danish Cistercian monastery. It was in function from 1172 till 1561 when it was torn down by the king. Today it's actually an excavation. It's a ruin where you're walking around at the bottom of the excavated area. And then there's a small building with a, an exhibition of, of some of the finds. But it is an open air museum, and therefore it's only open during the summertime. It's uh, situated in a very beautiful landscape in the middle of Dublin. We have a lot of lakes. We call it the Lake Highlands, and it was formed by the ice age when the ice melted and uh, a lot of rivers were, were running through the landscape and forming both lakes and valleys and everything. And this was a perfect place for those monks to, uh, to settle. They needed the water to transport the, the goods, and they used water digging channels to make mills where they could uh, have small industries and, and so on. The first excavations were in 1896 by the National Museum of Denmark. The Museum of Scarborough wasn't there at that time. They excavated a big ruin complex. The Cistercian Abbey has, of course, a church and some large buildings where monks and uh, all the other staff were living. And then a lot of graves. A thousand graves has been investigated throughout this, this big area. And you can see some of the graves there. There's five graves left to watch in situ in boxes now. So we have the excavations, the finds, the skeletons, and then we have some written sources. We have sort of a, the diary of the monks, the chronicle of the abbey. We don't have that at the museum, it's at the, the National uh, archive of Denmark, but we have copies and we know what's in there. And all that we use to try and explain this period of time in Denmark to uh, visitors and to pupils that are coming there to get knowledge. Because this was a Catholic period in Denmark. It ended with the reformation of the Danish church in 1536. And today not a lot of kids know about this. There aren't that many Catholics in Denmark. So a lot of this would be very unknown to children today.
And let's face it, a life of a monk with eight hours of prayers a day, eight hours of work, eight hours of rest, and doing the same day in and day out, that can be a bit hard to comprehend. So we try to introduce Living Museum as a tool, a learning tool, because they are monks, and therefore they understand about their everyday life with their own body. From 2009 to 2014, I've had a school session that we call Life of a Monk. It's an offer for school classes. We don't do it for, as we call them, free children. So um, it's not like at Live where you just come and participate. You actually order one of these school sessions, but they're for free for the schools of the municipality. It's three hours with a lunch break. And the kids, they all wear reconstructed woolen dresses, type C, I think, of the Cistercian order. You know, we thought about what we really wanted them to, to be used for. And so it's a type C. Good, you're listening. Yes. When the kids put on that dress, and it's a bit itchy, you know, it's wool, they get a new name. And that makes them act like a different person. They can put behind all the social problems, uh, Maybe they have a call with their best friend or something, but they are someone different when they put on that dress. And then we have this story that they are all young men, also the girls, you know, and I'm playing too because I'm really a lady. They're all confused when they see me in that dress. Uh, are you a nun? No. Because this is a monastery for monks. Okay. <laughs> are you a monk then? No. I'm a lady, but I'm playing just like you are. So that I'm using my own body to play that makes them better at doing it themselves. So, there are young men standing on the porch of the abbey. They are wanting to enter this order, and they do so as novices, monks on probation. That means you can fail, and that's all right. But you're learning. They get those dresses and the names. They leave their past behind them. I'm the abbot the leader of, of this abbey. And the abbot shows them around their new home. And as they walk there, they walk in pairs, in a procession. There's no talk, because they've just vowed, the monk vows, and one of them is silence. We stop at different places. We take the hood down. That means that you can ask questions. And we enter a dialogue about this weird place that they've just entered. But as the years have come by, I have sort of uh, narrowed down some challenges about this way of, uh, of teaching. Because what I really wanted was role play. I wanted the kids to act. And it turned out that uh, what I had was uh, what we call a storyline session. It's okay, but that's not what I wanted. It's a museum tour where you're dressed up and where you're feeling different things with your body, but you're not doing so much actively yourself. I wanted them to use their own knowledge and their own skills more. And then I had some other challenges. One was the role of the school teacher, because I think most people that work with school classes that come to museums has experienced that you have a class and you have the teacher and the teacher is there. Just, you know, deliver the class to you and then go in the back and sit there, arms crossed, and leave it all to you. Leaving the teaching, the learning process of the kids, and also the social problems to ones, you know, <laughs> and I have to go down, I don't know their names. That's, that's one thing because I'm only there for a short period with these kids. I have them for three hours. Sometimes I know them because maybe I've had them before. It's not that big a municipality, we have 20 primary schools. But mostly I don't know them, and I don't know what they bring into my session. I try to ask the, the, the teacher, what have you been doing before you came here, what are you doing when you come home? Because I want my stuff to, uh, to mix in perfectly with what the teacher from the school is doing, so that the kids get the most of it. 
And the teacher always says, oh, it's very nice what you're doing. It just fits in, yes. But I don't know what it has to fit into. And that's one of the things. So um, I've looked at it, and narrowing down to these two things, how the kids get the most of it, how the learning, their learning, is the most important thing. Then I have to know what's happening before and after. And then what do I do with the teacher, and how do I get the teacher to participate, so that the two of us are in on it together, because I think that's very important. Actually, we sort of have a name for that with the museum learning fitting in with the school learning, because we've just had um, a reform of our primary school, and now they have uh, entered um, a new saying. It's called supporting lessons, and that's what I'm doing. I've been doing that for six years, but now it has a name, supporting lessons. So I have reinvented my life for the month. Three hours was actually a bit, a bit less. So I put another hour to it. The school day has uh, grown longer for the kids, so it's okay. It's four hours now, less stress, we have time. I have uh, made a better preparation. Because now I know what they know when they come to me, because I go up to the schools and I make an introduction. It's an offer for the teachers, and uh, luckily for me, most of them take it. So when the school um, call me and say that they want this role play, uh, first of all, I uh, ask them to, t to bring um, the whole grade. You know, if we have a grade three and there's three classes, I ask them, can, you, can we please do it with all three classes? Because then I can go out to the school and make one big uh, preparation lesson for all of them, and then they can come to me class after class. That works very well. So I know what they know. I get to prepare them. And also I get them get to prepare them to playing role play because they didn't really get that before. You know, role play today is like yeah, Tolkien. Elves, orcs, Bashi. It's not like that where you're in a monastery. In those buildings. You're calm, you're quiet, you think inside your head. You don't bash anyone. So I get to prepare them for what to expect out there. And you should think that the teachers would have done that as well, but sometimes the teachers don't know what a role plays, so it's hard for them to prepare the kids to something that they don't really know. There's also less focus on this museum tour now. Yes, I bring them around the ruins and tell them where everything is, but I also did that at the school, using a PowerPoint, telling them where everything is, so that when they go out there, they kind of know the buildings already. And then I wanted to be more like a monk's day, with all these prayers and uh, these working periods and, uh, and the rest period. So um, taking that museum tour a bit out of it, I had more time for the rest of it. So we have now three prayers, periods of prayers, not eight as in real life, but it's a start. We have two work periods and we have, have one rest period. Because this is supposed to be learning. When you order a school session, it's learning, it's not just activism. So, I'd like to show you what work periods can be like when you're doing something like this, where it's actually activating the kids and where they're using knowledge to uh, do something with it. We have these two work sessions in between the prayers, and when it's prayer, I ring a bell, like they did at that time, and all the uh, monk novices gather in the church and then we say some, uh, some psalms and that's a prayer. But it's not something that they're used to. It's not, it's not Catholic schools that they're coming from. It's normal Protestant Danish primary schools. They don't know anything about prayers. So that's a different thing to do. After prayer, they go to a workstation. And I have two workstations. The aim for this is to teach them about uh, the look on sickness in the 14th, 15th centuries in Denmark. That's what we in Denmark call the late Middle Ages. Uh, we're a bit behind the rest of Europe with that Middle East stuff. But they, uh, they have to learn about this. And they do so in uh, two different workstations. One is a writing room, because that's what the monks did. They copied books. Before Gutenberg invented this copying press, you had to write them page by page. So one of the stations is that you have to rewrite a small piece where there is something about a plan. The other station in the garden, 
they have to, to know where the different plants are, because all these healing plants, some of them are very poisonous. But used in the right way, they can save somebody. So don't mix them up. So we have these two groups, and after another prayer, they have to save each other from horrible diseases, using those skills that they've just learned about with the plants and with what the plants can do. And uh, the thing about this look on illness in this period was that you have four liquids in the body. You have blood, slime, black, and yellow gal. Very nice. When they're unbalanced, you get sick. Your sickness is either warm or cold, and at the same time, it's dry or misty. So when you get an illness, you sort of try to define, is it a warm or cold illness, and is it, a, is it dry or is it misty? When it's misty, something's coming out of you, either from here or there. So all these kids get a card where it says what they have to tell their, their fellow novices who has to save them. And you can see this one, it's clearly a very misty disease. He's got a foam coming out of his uh, mouth. This one's growing up, very misty disease as well. And then they have to get the opposite plants because that's going to save their pals. I think what I've done by now is working very well. Of course, I'm working on further with it and also about this complex about the roles of the teachers because it is kind of a complex one. The teacher from the school is coming out seeking an expert. The expert is the archaeologist, the museum teacher. But then again, the museum teacher doesn't know the kids as well as the school teacher. So we have these two different roles, grown-up roles, and they have to learn to work together because the aim of this session is for the pupils to get the best learning experience. Not teaching experience, but learning experience. What they get out of it. Not just, uh, just activism, but something that possibly could change their life inside their head. And as you can see, all those ones, they're ready to be monks. Thank you.